The older I get, the more I realize there are certain game elements that can either make or break an experience for me. For example, if a game sends endless waves of the same enemies at me over and over again, even if the mechanics are interesting, I'm sent straight to Snoozeville. Likewise, shooters in general I find rather boring nowadays. But if a game has some gorgeous pixel art, I'm already a bit more intrigued. Obviously I'm talking personal preference here, but perhaps the most important aspect to me in this regard is also one that's fundamental to a game's design. Movement. You've probably heard someone say that a game just feels good to play and move around in. But what exactly causes that? It's not like games automatically come that way, it clearly takes a lot of playtesting and polish to reach that perfect level of smoothness, and I've come up with several different pieces that need to work together in order for that to be the case. Welcome to another episode of Good Game Design. Let's talk about it. First and most obvious is simply speed, right? Or at least being able to go at a speed that you would like. Nothing is more agonizing than watching your character move at a snail's pace with no way to go any faster. Most games fix this by having a run button, so you can walk when you need to or speed things up as you'd like. But it's not just about being quick. Moving at Mach 5 can be just as frustrating if the game doesn't have a sense of flow. The way a series of obstacles and jumps link together and work in tandem seem to have a greater impact on the feeling of satisfaction I get than blazing through as fast as possible. Ghost Runner is one of the best at this I've seen in recent memory. Using your dash, grapple hook, time slow to dodge bullets, and sword to cut down enemies left and right in such quick succession feels incredible when you finally pull it off. This is a very fast paced game, so another way it keeps the flow going is by letting you quick retry by pressing R, so you never lose momentum waiting for a death animation or something, you set the pace of the action. Games with good flow don't have a lot of waiting around, and they easily telegraph what you need to do next so there's no confusion about where to go or what input to press. This is hard to pull off when you're moving at such fast speeds, so using bright colors or big identifiable landmarks to draw your attention go a long way into making the course of events feel natural. On top of this, it really helps when the player gets strong feedback from the game when they pull off a desired action. Now, this comes in the form of having tight and responsive controls, but also lots of juice and visual flair. It's almost a given that the game doing exactly what you want it to when you press a button lets you feel more in control of your character. But uh, look at Hades and all the cool particle effects that flash on screen when you dash around. In fact, this is borderline too much feedback. Sometimes it can clutter the screen and be hard to tell what's happening when you pulverize baddies. But all I know is it feels awesome when you hastily and flawlessly clear out a room. Crumble is another good example. Once you reach those breakneck speeds, it adds these whooshing lines around the edge to really make it feel like you're busting through the sound barrier or something. I would also say a great aspect of positive feedback is giving more grace to the player even when it shouldn't technically be possible. Celeste, as many of you know, helped popularize the term coyote time, where it still lets the player jump for a few additional frames after falling off a platform. In a game all about precision, the key to making it feel manageable and fostering its encouraging atmosphere is leaning toward forgiveness instead of keeping its rigid rule set in place. Shovel Knight also does this with King Knight's campaign. If you bash in the air and accidentally get hit, it refills your ability to bash again, which lets you do some quick recovery work and save yourself from a potential death. The beauty of extra grace is that you may not even realize the developers did it, and instead it just translates to better feeling controls and like you were the epic gamer who pulled off a crazy trick. The next thing that makes players feel empowered in their movement is having multiple options in how to get around. Being able to cross wide expanses or scale buildings with a variety of different moves leads to greater player expression and freedom, not to mention the glorious epiphany they get when they discover the different ways to complete objectives. Wings of V may be the only game I'm aware of that stores your ability to jump until you hit the jump button. Let me explain, say you have a double jump and fall off a platform. You only have one more jump before you run out, right? Well, not in Wings of V. You would still have both jumps available, and the entire game uses that to your advantage, making crazy level layouts that look impossible totally doable when you combine your jump, float, slide, and dash moves together. It's a spectacle to be sure. But it goes further than character mechanics. Being able to decide when you want to move can be equally as satisfying. 
Check out Rift World 2, a brand new ROM hack by Freakin' Ha. Unlike other Kaizo hacks, there's actually quite a lot of breathing room and safe ledges to rest on in this game, which makes the blistering challenge a lot more reasonable. But if you want to, all the cycles line up perfectly so that you can rush through without slowing down. This is a great way to motivate the player to learn slowly and safely at first, and then work toward mastery as you get further into the stage. Once you feel confident in a section, you can breeze through without Without having to wait. It's always a plus in my book when the hazards and obstacles in a stage fall into place, so you can truck by without a second thought once you've internalized the patterns. And I mean, we've all experienced the opposite, right? Having to wait for a spinning platform or path to open up, it's maddening. What goes hand in hand with this is when a game will reward the player for their skill. Like in the Pathless, you gain a speed boost whenever you hit these archery targets, and it fills your stamina meter as well. When you run out, things slow way down to a light jog. But if you can get the timing right of chaining your shots together, you'll never lose your speed. Combine this with aerial tricks, gliding with your bird friend, and even faster boosts and higher jumps later on, and you have a movement system that ends up feeling more like a rhythm game or something. Very unique. Last but not least, I think when a game uses its movement tech for more purposes than just running fast, it drastically adds to its cohesiveness and overall polish. Take Donkey Kong Country. The animal buddies not only increase your speed and survivability, but you can glide with Espresso, jump extra high with Winky, or break open walls with Rambi to explore and find all of its hidden secrets as well. In many titles, your dashes and rolls might get you around faster, but they also can be useful in combat too. Anytime a game uses its abilities to do more than just move left or right, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities, including the chaos that speedrunners unfold when they use these moves in unintended ways. I called this using all the buffalo in my last good game design. Check it out here if you happen to miss that episode. Now, all of this is fine, but it's worth mentioning that not every game has to have these elements to feel rewarding or like it has good controls. Games like Castlevania and Dark Souls are notorious for how strict and slow their movement is. I mean, this is the only way to go upstairs, like, come on! But it depends on what the game's structure and goals are. These are much more methodical and cautious adventures, where each input you make could be a one-way ticket to your death. So their level of speed makes a lot more sense. And when you do change the formula, it can completely alter the feel of the experience. I think a lot of games have serviceable movement. They get the job done, but they don't really excel or stay memorable. But the best ones combine the various elements we discussed together, and work in harmony to create a diverse and enjoyable journey. One that lets a player's creativity shine and feel like the sky's the limit. What about you? What do you think are the most effective tools in building a gratifying movement system? What are some games that feel the best to move around in? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Real quick, before we get to today's sponsor, I wanted to announce that I've officially launched a separate channel called Snowman Gameplay, as an archive of all the footage I've ever recorded that I'm now allowing anyone to use for their own projects. We're talking over 500 games and 2,000 clips represented here, and I want it to be a community effort that continues to grow and help creators work smarter, not harder. Check it out in the description below and watch the channel trailer for details about the Google Sheet and how to best find what you're looking for. I hope it's something that can be of use to you. It's the least I can do to say thanks for those that support the channel. And hey, speaking of resources, today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Now, more than ever, our internet reliance has been rapidly increasing, from streaming our favorite shows to keeping in touch with loved ones and even our banking. We'd like to think our information is safe, but as our online footprint increases, so does our need for proper security. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information by encrypting all the data you send through the internet. Another great reason to use a VPN is because content from streaming services can be restricted based on what country you're in. So with Surfshark, you can solve that by simply changing your location. The best news of all is that Surfshark has a phenomenal deal right now, where you can use the link in the description and use promo code SNOWMAN for 83% off and 3 additional months free of charge. Yeah, seriously, that's like a couple bucks a month for full protection and a ton of other benefits. Surfshark also offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's no commitment if you don't like it. Once more, check it out by clicking the link below and using the code SNOWMAN to start surfing safely today. Bye bye